Well, thank you very much for that presentation, ladies and gentlemen. When medical therapies have failed, there is just a, a circulatory uh, support that can work. So, mechanical support for refractory CS, conflict of interest, the usual slide. Now, the counter pulsation balloon uh, we, uh, is deceased. It is defunct. It is no longer deceased to be. So we shown that BPIA, uh, IAPB has no interest. Uh, now it's uh, reflecting the history of uh, um, medical sciences. Uh, we used to. Uh, use this sort of uh, device uh, uh, a few decades ago is not proper support. It does not increase the cardiac rate. But here, mortality at 30 days, 40 percent, 50 percent at one year. So there is clearly here room for improvement in years to come. This is a, a totally negative uh, test and trial, which has resulted in changing the ESC guidelines in 2010. It was open. Uh, there should be a counterposition uh, balloon, um, orange light in 2015. In 2014, light is totally red, no longer any or hardly any uh, indication for an intra aortic balloon counterposition. What are the other devices that are available to us uh, when uh, there are three categories of uh, patients that, that can result from that, uh, benefit from that? Medical cardiogenic shock, infarct, um, myocardial infarction, first of all. In cardiology centers, the centers that do transplants, cardiopathies that have been decompensated, uh, fulminating cardiopathies, uh, all sorts of taco, tubo, sepsis, uh, drug overdose of potential indications. The second group is cardiac arrest in the hospital setting. Outside the hospital setting, I uh, really have strong reservations given the situation in France. The uh, times or time intervals are so long that they are not compatible with ECMO strategies and the like. Uh, post cardio to me, these are for a cardiac uh, surgery centers because they need to be performed for the most critically ill patients. Second major question for us, when to initiate mechanical assistance? There is no single answer to that question. There is no magical wand. Um, it all depends on the type of patient. It's not the same thing if you are dealing with a CS patient in the acute phase or somebody who will has decompensated and will gradually evolve towards a refractory uh, syndrome. There are small uh, signs uh, showing inadequation between the metabolic requirements of the patient and uh, what he's getting, nausea, abdominal pain, alteration of consciousness. Um, skin modeling, tachycardia with the uh, dobutamine, which is toxic for the heart. I agree with what has been said. The rhythm disturbances, the ionic disturbances, acidosis. Uh, when lactate is above uh, 2, 5, or 3, you have a problem. Hepatic failure, renal failure, Doppler echocardiography essential for the proper management of these patients. It's not the FE, the LVEF here that matters, but when you have a low cardiac output, when AOVTI is below 7, 8 centimeter, you need to discuss with the team the possible use of these machines to prevent disaster here in this uh, patient assisted the PTS salpetriere for venous arterial ECMO. Here he is, there is a cardiac arrest and mortality shoots up by a ratio of 20. And here again, uh, with uh, mortality being multiplied by four to seven, depending on the cases. So regarding the emergency framework and uh, the classical indications for medical assistance, we had uh, four times of uh, indication, uh, bridge uh, to bridge, bridge to recovery, uh, bridge to transplantation and destination therapy. And 
uh, CMO in this framework uh, will be used for everything that appears reasonable, including withdrawal of the machine after a few days. Um, we can do some sorting out, and ECMO needs to be withdrawn if there is a serious indication. What kind of uh, machine, what kind of pump? Well, in the acute phase, HMAT2, uh, uh, HWARE, TAH, uh, these are machines that cost between 15,000 and 100,000 euros. These before the days of the heart transplant. So um, there are other short-term devices that I'm going to discuss in a while. Here is the uh, Intermax classification, uh, the North American one, uh, which is the reference uh, benchmark for all decisions of mechanical support, particularly for the long duration ones. Uh, here we have what we call in English a crash and burn scenarios, and I would even ask zero, at zero here, Patients already dead, and you are dealing with these patients. Uh, three types of um, devices. First, we have the tandem heart, which is a device available in the States, not so much in Europe. It uses a transeptal catheter or system of catheters uh, to position the cannula at the level of the left atrium and the centrifugal pump will re-inject uh, the blood in this way. And uh, this is a uh, machine that presents a number of uh, drawbacks. Oxygenated blood is drawn from there and returned via centrifugal pump and via an arterial cannula in the femoral artery. Problem is connected to um, increased mortality because of pericardial uh, tamponade, aortic puncture, limb ischemia, bleeding transfusion. And the main problem is limited flow generating by that form of support. 2.5 liter, 3 liters at the most, not enough very often for a multi organ failure patient. A second type of uh, machine is all the Impala family. The Impella family. Here we have two, the most widely used today. The little one, 2.5, it has the advantage of being able to be in position. Uh, um, uh, retrograde, retrogradely through the aortic valve, the microaxial pump continuously aspirates blood from the left ventricle and expels it to the ascending aorta. And we have a maximal flow of 2.5 liter per minute in reality. Is probably 1.5 liter, and the big one it says uh, 3.54, but it's less. And it, it needs uh, for, for the Impella 5, it's a surgical access through a, a, a Dacron tube, which is sutured at the level of a uh, an artery here and is then positioned in the left ventricle. These are amazing uh, devices, uh, true three to five millimeter diameter with a, a screw that goes, uh, turns around at 35,000 revs per minute. Uh, they are extremely expensive, 10 to 15,000 euros. You have to be very rich. And we are so fortunate in Bordeaux as to be in that situation. Uh, as opposed to ECMO techniques, four to five times less expensive. Uh, but the problem is the durability, a few hours to a few days for the 2.5 version, a few days for the 5.0 version. And if you need to assist and provide support to a patient for two to three weeks, not convincing. Some papers in the literature have assessed the results of that technology, particularly in the CS uh, uh, for an in fact, uh, here a study in the Netherlands, the 2.5 clearly is not effective. Only Impella 5 is acceptable. The 2.5 may be acceptable for angioplasties, but uh, really you need Impella 0.5. The new Impella in the Impella families, Impella CP, a bit like uh, the uh, five zero version uh, with a maximum blood flow of four liters per minute, uh, but in actual fact, probably less. Uh, results are not entirely convincing. We have a problem of cost, durability, hemolysis, <coughs> uh, 
uh, which uh, very often comes with these um, devices. Uh, so clearly today for all these reasons, uh, VA ECMO is a first intent device in these situations because they're easy to um, set up. A cardiac surgeon who has experience can do it uh, under local anesthesia. You don't need any cardiac surgery or what have you. It's really the first line uh, uh, therapy for a CS situation. Uh, peripheral cannulation uh, with here a femoral artery cannulation site. You see here you can even have a straight percutaneous with this a technique, uh, they uh, deliver up to seven or even eight liter per uh, minute in a uh, uh, CS situation. You don't need as much. Uh, uh, 3.5 liter, 4 or maximum 5 liters sufficient. If you increase flow too much, then you're going to have a, a situation with a pulmonary edema, more likely, most likely. So you have a cardiopulmonary assistance, very often associated with these patients. So these uh, this device has an oxygenator here on the central unit controllers. They have uh, now uh, in pressure. Uh, monitoring systems in them also. Looking more closely at uh, ECMO results uh, in the context of STEMI with uh, refractory cardiac uh, failure, very little data is reliable. We just have case uh, series. Uh, this is a study before and after um, uh, ECMO support. Mortality goes down from 70% uh, to 39%, but there is a strong bias uh, probably connected to revascularization or early revascularization strategies. It was just, by the way, at the time when the shock um, trials were published, so it's probably connected. Now, fulminant myocarditis is probably one of the best indications in this pathology. Uh, recovery is very um, common. Not always, but very often, young patients. Uh, and in the long term, here we we see after two years, survival rate is 72 uh, percent. So, but again, we're dealing with young patients and a specific uh, pathology that is potentially um, going to be cured. So, and a good prognosis uh, now. Here with a, a second series and the best series today with mixed results, mortality high in first days or weeks, but survivors uh, have a good prognosis. So then there will be further problems, ethical problems for the patient that has had this device. Well, there's a problem if you can't wean them and they are not eligible for transplants. Cardiac transplants are not possible anymore without these uh, techniques. Before the days of transplants, uh, you had 30 percent of patients in France uh, who were under ECMO uh, in super emergency uh, situations, any post-op for uh, uh, graft, uh, primary graft failure because uh, of a right ventricle uh, failure or other with the ECMO, uh, there could be a good recovery from a lot of patients who previously would die or would get an uh, uh, artificial heart. Uh, uh, massive uh, embolism or massive pulmonary emboli. Uh, today, there is no longer an indication for pulmonary embolectomy. Uh, our uh, surgeon friends uh, do not like this very much, but uh, uh, waiting for the uh, clot to dissolve under epirin uh, five to six days is what you should do, and then you can wean the patient from the machine. And no sternotomy, no surgery is uh, necessary anymore. Now, in some very uh, serious forms of septic shock uh, evolving towards uh, severe LV failure, this is extremely serious. Uh, this is a small series uh, we had uh, two or three years ago, uh, 14 patients <coughs> in refractory septic shock. This is extremely serious uh, and, uh, and rare. 
the uh, 16 percent, 16 percent of uh, ejection fraction, uh, pH uh, 7, uh, 16, 9 lactate. Uh, these people are clearly dying in the process of dying and uh, having a veno arterial uh, ECMO for these patients. Uh, well, we save them uh, almost 70 percent of them and uh, some will uh, be switched to another form of uh, ECMO, venovenous ECMO. So ECMO after cardiac arrest, well, that's uh, quite an issue. Just one message here. If we can start ECMO in the 30 day, uh, minutes following a cardiac arrest uh, and the machine is on in the six, within 60 minutes, then you can get this, which is about 30% of long-term survival uh, rate with a patient who, from the neurological standpoint, will be surgical preserved. But in other, or all other cases, we should be able to say no or refer these patients to uh, uh, other systems such as um, organ donation. Uh, ECMO can also be transported to the patient, taken to the patient, and that's probably the best solution. We have to get ourselves organized at the local, regional, national level with whole networks, with reference center in the middle of it all, which is a surgical center, because at one stage or another you will need cardiac surgery with a mobile ECMO rescue team that can scan the territory and then take the patient back, if need be, to the reference center. The Pitié Salpetrière here in Paris, uh, we have set up the first mobile ECMO uh, unit 10, day, uh, 10 years ago. On this paper, you look at the first 10 patients that benefited from this uh, uh, strategy. Uh, in the greater Paris area or Ile-de-France area. These patients, at least 50 percent of them, had a myocardial uh, infarct, uh, that infarction that was evolving, uh, dilated myopathies, cardiomyopathies. And in this series, uh, we have a long-term survival rate of 35 percent. We've compared the seven cohorts of patients of mobile ECMO versus a cohort that benefited from ECMO within the hospital setting and after a multivariate analysis, no impact. And so we see that, and recently these results were uh, confirmed. If you can set up uh, the um, system, the machine, before there is too much uh, involvement or disorders, there you're on the right track. Uh, finally, uh, uh, the problem of um, Veno arterial extract, corporal membrane oxygenation. The problem is that you increase the hard load. So very often you have patients uh, that uh, had little uh, mechanical activity, uh, they will stop. And then you have a hydrostatic pulmonary edema risks associated. And in this situation, you can associate to the ECMO and uh, IABP. Uh, this is a work on 10 or 12 patients. A balloon on or balloon off, and when we stopped it, we saw that Pablo would go sh would shoot up with his patients. So, so with the, the IABP, you unload the left ventricle, ventricle. You prevent some uh, uh, pulmonary edema. Now, what is the evidence in terms of ECMO for refractory uh, CS? We have little evidence uh, because, uh, well, in the last uh, uh, guidelines of the European Society 2014, we said that uh, uh, hard teams should be set up to be able to come up with the most complex decisions, uh, but we are still uh, with an orange light here when it comes to ACS uh, for patients with a cardiogenic shock. We need more evidence. This is going to be the focus of the study we're about to launch in the forthcoming months called ANCOR, the ANCOR trial, uh, funded by the uh, 2014 PRC uh, funding system. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, it will compare uh, the control arm with the uh, arm that will get uh, uh, early uh, peripheral venoarterial ECMO. Uh, we'll try uh, to have uh, teams present everywhere working within the 
network called ECMONED, totally international, with uh, centers throughout the world to promote research in these areas. By way of conclusion, uh, for these uh, very critically ill patients, uh, even this strategy is far from being perfect. It is the easiest to implement and to uh, uh, have a better cost efficiency um, ratio. We really need to get ourselves properly organized. It's not really the case today in France, as opposed to what you have in other countries, such as the, the UK. We need more evidence. And we have great expectations regarding this randomized study, uh, which will start uh, this year. And next June, if you're interested in that, uh, there will be the International Congress in Paris, as uh, is the case every year. Please come and join us then. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you very much.